Dr. Rapp is a diplomat of the uh, Jung Institute in Zurich. In 1976, he had his diploma there. He studied with Marty Louise Walt Franz and Barbara Hanna, among other luminaries. And um, Dr. Rapp says, one can say that any outer worldly situation can provide clues about something that is meaningful. Many outer situations point to an inner image that can be experienced directly through active imagination. By seeking the meaning of life events, the ego escapes from the illusory world of fantasy that only sees concrete reality and appearances. A conflict with a boss, a car accident, a headache, a sick pet, all of these events may be perceived with the eyes of the imagination. Such a perspective frees one from the sense of being trapped in the situation and permits one to seek the meaning related to it. Working with meaning opens up possibilities that were hidden before. One views an external state of affairs as if it were a dream. Dreams can be interpreted and understood. One does not simply need to identify with them. Then he goes on. One could say that perceiving the hidden meaning of a contact, content or outer situation activates a type of power contained in that situation. Paracelsus referred to the healing efficacy of, herb, of herbs so that understanding the true significance of an herb allowed the physician to use it to its best effect. It is very possible that seeing an outer situation with the imaginative vision elicits a transformative and healing process that directly affects the situation. Imagination not only creates insights, but transformation as well. So may it be so, and let's welcome Dr. Rapp. <laughs> Thank you. Can you well, I get to talk about one of my favorite topics today, so I'm glad to be here. Alchemy was actually the thing that got me interested in Jung way back when. And the first books I ever read of Jung were his alchemical works, which, if you've read Jung, is, I was like 23, I think. So it was ambitious to say the least uh, but over the years that interest in alchemy has continued uh, with along with the development of my interest in Jung uh, until about uh, 15 years ago is when I wrote the first book uh, Jung and the Alchemical Imagination which was my attempt to try and, and revision a little bit of alchemy uh, the interpretation of alchemy based on a lot of what Jung had done, but uh, trying to move it forward just a little bit as well. Most people today have heard about alchemy and typically uh, know that it had something to do with trying to make gold and transform lead into gold. And the word alchemy has become fairly frequent in our culture, meaning usually some kind of magical change or transformation or the alchemy of cooking or things like that. Uh, most scholars up until the time of Jung, and many still today, believed uh, that alchemy was what they called proto-chemistry, that it was actually a form of chemistry uh, that was undeveloped and was uh, reflective of the ignorance of the time. And only with the advent of the scientific method did alchemy move from proto-chemistry to real chemistry. Very few people, especially before Jung, talked about alchemy as a spiritual tradition. But today, many, uh, not many, but uh, people who study what's called spiritual alchemy uh, place alchemy squarely in what's called the esoteric spiritual tradition. This includes most spiritual traditions that are not orthodox, that are not mainstream. They include uh, hermeticism, Kabbalah, uh, Gnosticism, and some aspects of Sufism, and definitely alchemy. Jung was very concerned to put himself in some kind of historical context. The term uh, esoteric spirituality was not yet used uh, when Jung was alive, but I think if it had been, he would have placed Jungian psychology, especially the spiritual aspects of it, squarely in that tradition. He believed that alchemy was a forerunner of Jungian psychology, and most especially Gnosticism was. 
Fortunately for us, uh, there was very little literature on Gnosticism for Jung to study, so he, he went with alchemy instead, uh, which I am grateful for. All of these schools, uh, Kabbalah, uh, the Hermetic school, Gnosticism especially, had a great influence on alchemy, and alchemy had a big influence on uh, them. All the traditions of the esoteric spirituality uh, influence each other. So in order to understand alchemy, we're going to tonight have to talk a little bit about uh, Gnostic myth, uh, because uh, the spiritual underpinnings of alchemy derive uh, directly from uh, Gnosticism. And again, we don't know who influenced what, which began first, uh, but it, it seems pretty clear that Gnostic thought had a big impact on the development of alchemical thought. People either love alchemy, as was said, or they hate alchemy. And in my experience, most people hate alchemy. And if you want to know why, you should read an alchemical text. Uh, it's totally incomprehensible. Uh, when I wrote my book, I decided that I knew a lot about what Jung thought about alchemy, but I didn't know a lot about alchemy. So I uh, started to read all the alchemical texts I could find that were in English. And this was definitely a form of masochistic punishment. Uh, but as I'll uh, talk a little bit later about it, hidden within this chaos are some real gems. And the underlying principles of alchemy, if you eliminate some of the uh, verbosity, are profound. And uh, that's the reason that Jung was really so fascinated with it. He believed, again, that alchemy uh, in its kind of uh, weird imagery depicted what he called the individuation process, the, the process by which a person becomes a whole person, in which the ego is transformed into the self. But at whatever level uh, psychology and other traditions you might want to study, there's always you know, the process of transformation that one is concerned with, and alchemy is all about transformation. Uh, the whole basis of alchemy is that everything can be transformed. Uh, as I'll explain in a minute, this is again uh, one of the underlying mythic images for alchemy. There were definitely alchemists who were not spiritually inclined. They're what we call today practical alchemists. They're the ones that worked with the, the chemicals and the furnaces and the vessels and the pelicans and all that good stuff. But there were also alchemists who knew that alchemy was actually an esoteric system and in, in some ways a, uh, uh, a tradition that you had to be initiated into in order to fully understand. The alchemists were deliberately confusing. They never told you what they really meant because they wanted you to figure it out. And if you could figure it out, that was your initiation. Typically, in the, in when alchemy was going strong, you had to have a teacher who would initiate you into its secrets. So from the very beginning of alchemy, there was two, two aspects of it, practical and spiritual. Uh, from the writings, very early writings of Zosimos, <coughs> a Jewish writer named Maria Prophetisa, who was considered uh, in, by many scholars to be the founder of alchemy and one of the very few women alchemists that we know about. Uh, both of those individuals lived in about the second or third century AD in the, in the Middle East. They, from the very beginning, uh, were given to the spiritual aspect of it, but they were also, especially Zosimus, was also very much practical uh, alchemist. Alchemy sought to uncover the mystery of matter. They wanted to understand why things happened in the material world, like why does spring come? You know, well, we have an idea about the rotation of the earth and all of that, and they had some of those ideas, but they also believed there was a goddess responsible. And so if you could relate to that goddess, you would learn the secret of bringing things to life, just as occurs in springtime. 
So their interest in matter was not exactly what we would normally think of as a, a physicist being interested in matter. Mm -hmm. Because the matter, the, the, the mystery of, of matter that they were seeking to uncover was its spiritual nature. For the practicing alchemist, the sharp distinction between spirit and matter that we make was not made. For them, spirit and matter were intimately involved with each other. Matter was not dead. Matter was very much alive because, as we'll see, it contained a spiritual core. Uh, the idea that we have, uh, so-called duality between uh, matter and spirit, would be very alien to the early alchemists. They were concerned with uncovering the spiritual principle and uh, concrete core of matter and then transforming both the material aspect of it and the spiritual aspect of it and then uniting those two at a whole different level than they started with. Uh, and we'll see that if they, uh, when they talked about succeeding in doing that, they were talking about a transformation uh, from the divine world all the way down to the, to the human world. Before we go into the imagery more, I wanted to just lay out a little bit of the history of alchemy, uh, which is also quite interesting. Uh, alchemy is uh, a tradition that refuses to die. It's been with us at least 2,200 years. The origins of alchemy, scholars typically put at about 200 BC. That's a pretty arbitrary number, but it's the uh, date at which the first alchemical text uh, was discovered. It was written around that time. Uh, we have some rudimentary texts before that, but not very many, and certainly not in the same detail. Interestingly, this first text from 200 BC lays out all the symbolism of alchemy that we're still dealing with today. There's a lot of debate about how alchemy or originated. Did it start in Egypt? Did it start in China? Uh, some other place in the Middle East? Nobody knows for sure. We do know it's one of those phenomena, again, that you see often in the history of ideas. Uh, it's probably started at the same time in China and Egypt. Uh, they certainly could have influenced each other because there was trade between those countries at that time. Uh, but we don't have any evidence one way or the other. According to uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, uh, who was a great student of alchemy and one of my teachers, uh, the uh, origins of alchemy can be traced to Egypt and especially to the Egyptian practice of mummification. In Egypt, again, the sharp distinction we make between matter and spirit was not no. Uh, for the Egyptian, if you were going to have eternal life, you needed a body that would live forever, that would never decay, it would never corrupt. And that's why mummification was discovered. Uh, the Egyptians were constantly looking for a way to preserve the physical body because they believed if the physical body was destroyed, the spiritual body would be destroyed as well. At first, only the pharaoh had a mummy. Uh, eventually, all the nobles got to have their own mummies. Uh, and the common people never could afford mummification, but they were given little tiny toy mummies uh, that were to represent their body in the afterlife. So in the practice of mummification, you already have a very interesting combination of spirituality and chemistry. Uh, the, the Egyptians really did discover the chemical formula for the preservation of the body in a mummified form. Uh, and it, uh, some of that is still a mystery to us, how they actually did it. But some of it is known. But at the same time, they never simply did chemically, uh, chemistry on the body. Every step of the way, they had chants and prayers, and priests would do certain rituals. And so the chemical change was seen as uh, being caused as much by the chemistry as by the, the chants and the prayers. And so already in Egypt, you have this idea that you could create an immortal body through the combination of spiritual and material 
techniques. So the preservation of that immortal body required both. And it was really with the decline of the Egyptian religion uh, due to outside influences that mummification pretty much ceased as a technique in practice. This combination in Egypt would not have led to what we know uh, as alchemy were it not for uh, the emergence of war. We're going to see at every step of the way war is intimately involved with the spread of alchemical ideas. It's a very interesting side effect of the wars that were fought. This first war was the wars of Alexander the Great, who, as you probably know, created a, a huge empire stretching from Greece to Iran and uh, the rest of the Middle East and even to the borders of India. Of course, he couldn't hold it together. He died early. Uh, his successors fought over who would take over the empire, and they, they broke it up into three different pieces. One of those pieces was, uh, uh, contained Egypt. And what happened was when the, uh, after Alexander's death and the establishment of these three empires, Greeks moved out of Greece and into the Middle East. So you had the birth of what today is called the Hellenistic Age, uh, where Greek ideas pretty much took over the world, kind of the way that American ideas have spread throughout the world. They were a little bit more philosophical. Uh, and in the, 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 what the Greeks introduced to the Middle East was philosophy, and in particular the very deep brand of philosophy that the Greeks had, had developed. Aristotle, who was a companion of Alexander the Great, had a great influence on the, the beginnings of alchemy, but so did Plato, the Stoics, uh, and other Greek schools. Uh, there have been a number of books written about well, the Greek influence on the Egyptian uh, people and their ideas, but uh, as we'll see, what they introduced was a philosophy of spirit and matter, which became the, the basis for pursuing alchemy. It was like the theoretical structure that, according to Aristotle, the uh, transmutation of lead into gold was very practical. It was very reasonable given his physics. And I'll explain that too in a bit. So he provided this, this idea that uh, turning lead into gold was actually something that was achievable. It was not a fantastical idea. Uh, it, it was in line with, with philosophy. Uh, there are a whole lot of alchemical concepts that derive from other schools of Greek thought as well. So this Greek period goes from about 200 BC to 600 AD, <clears throat> roughly 800 years. And when we talk about Greek alchemy because this was the Hellenistic age. But what we talk about with Greek alchemy is actually uh, alchemy that was studied in Syria and uh, uh, Iran, Iraq, Middle Eastern countries, far more than Greece. Most of the alchemists from this period were not Greek per se. They all spoke Greek, and they were all influenced by, by the Greeks. So uh, for about 700 years, alchemy thrived. People were running around trying to not only create gold, but to create the immortal body and uh, the anthropos, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But it's gradually lost its energy. It became more and more a poetic device. And eventually, by about 600 AD, it was used as a metaphor for Christianity. Philosopher's Stone was Jesus, and so on. But as a, as a spiritual discipline, as part of the esoteric tradition, it was very, very weak by that point. And then war happened again. And this time, it was the Muslim conquest of the Middle East. Uh, within a hundred years, the uh, Arabs conquered a great, great empire. They defeated the Byzantine Empire and, and took Egypt and Syria, the rest of the Middle Eastern countries. And in doing so, they discovered the Greek alchemical texts, 
and they took those home with them, uh, translated them into Arabic, and alchemy came back to life as an Arabic form of alchemy. Unfortunately, most of the alchemical texts in Arabic have not been translated into English. Um, it's a, there's, there is a movement in Zurich uh, that has succeeded in translating, I think it's four volumes now, of uh, Arabic alchemical texts, but it means we don't know a whole lot about what these uh, texts would portray. We do know that the Arabs most interested in alchemy were Sufis. And the alchemy and the Sufi tradition combined in a great way. Jabir the Sufi, he was called, was the uh, first great Arabic writer on uh, alchemy. Our word gibberish comes from his name, by the way. It shows you what alchemy was thought of even back then. Uh, so it thrived in the Middle East once more. Uh, it was combined with a fantastic con uh, theoretical construct about the imagination, uh, which has had a tremendous influence on alchemy, but also on the concept of imagination, uh, especially through the writings of Henry Corbin, who wrote four or five books on the Sufis uh, and their theory of imagination. He had a great influence on Hillman, uh, and he was certainly uh, familiar with Jung and Jung with him. Uh, <clears throat> he was probably, I think, the greatest writer on imagination in, the, in modern times because we now know that a number of the ideas that he attributed to the Sufis were really his ideas. They were consistent with the Sufis, but you don't always find them in the Sufi writing itself which means he did a great transmutation of their ideas into something that's still very useful to us. But slowly but surely, uh, again, alchemy began to lose steam and uh, fade away when another war happened. This was the Crusades, a terrible series of wars uh, carried out with a tremendous amount of slaughter on both sides, which we still feel today. But one of its side effects is that the Crusaders discovered the Greek texts that the Arabs had taken and brought it back to Europe, and alchemy was born again. In this period of alchemical history we call the Latin period because most of the writing of the alchemical texts were in Latin. That was the, you know, the English of the day. Everybody who was anybody could speak Latin and wrote in Latin and so on. Also because many of the early alchemists were actually priests and monks uh, who were obviously conversant with, with uh, the Latin language. In this period, which is normally what we think of when we think of alchemy, because we have so many texts from this period, uh, lasted again about 600 years the birth of the scientific method around the 1700s effectively branded alchemy as a fraudulent uh, heresy that really had very little value to it. Interestingly, those uh, scientists who introduced the, the scientific period like uh, Boyle and Newton were also practicing alchemists. For them, there was no conflict between science and alchemy. They tried to apply scientific methods to the alchemical experiments. But by the time Newton died, his assistant uh, burnt all of his alchemical manuscripts because he was afraid it would ruin his reputation because alchemy had by that time descended very low. And it pretty much disappeared for a long time. This was its, probably its most extensive death, if you like. And slowly in the 20th century, it started to come back to life again as psychology. Now, Jung wasn't the first. There were three or four other writers uh, who wrote on alchemy and psychology, or alchemy and spirituality as well. But they were very rudimentary. Uh, 
and uh, certainly didn't have the breadth and the depth of insight that Jung brought to it. Jung was given an alchemical text, I think it was around 1920, and he said he left it on his desk for a year because he thought, what total nonsense is this? Why would I even look at this? And then he had the big insight that changed forever the study of alchemy. He realized that the alchemists were talking symbolically and that the imagery that they were using was the same imagery you could find in dreams. And that uh, when he went on to develop the idea of the archetype, he realized that alchemy was uh, filled with archetypal images. So that very simple statement, I can interpret an alchemical text in the same way I can interpret a dream, transformed the study of alchemy from about 1930 till maybe 10 years ago, you could not study alchemy without studying Jung. He was the master, for sure. As is always the case, there, there is now a generation that doesn't like him as their master, so they've attacked him fairly ruthlessly. That, that's fairly typical. But there are still very many uh, who study alchemy that have been tremendously influenced by uh, by Jung's approach. He systemized the study of alchemy, again by applying psychological and dream interpretation technique, uh, especially the one that he called amplification. In amplification, you take a dream image or an image from a myth, and you study that same image as it appears in different traditions. So you might study, uh, let's say, the alchemical image of the king, you might look in the Bible for the imagery of the king. You might look in medieval uh, sagas for the imagery of the king and fairy tales for the imagery of the king. You take all of those images of the king and you try to make a statement about what the king would mean universally. This is generally what it means wherever it appears. And that means when you have a dream about a king, uh, if your analyst or therapist knows how to amplify, they can tell you uh, some pretty good information about it. It's not like saying the king is the father, say. It's much more complex than that. But we try to get to some kind of idea of why you would be dreaming about a king to begin with. So he offered many, many stunning insights into the nature of alchemy through the interpretation of these images. Like any person, he interpreted from his own perspective. For him, it was the revelation of the collective unconscious uh, and the inner world that we all share. The alchemist had the same inner world that we do, and according to Jung, they projected it onto matter uh, and had experiences, numinous experiences of a, of a psychological and spiritual nature. Again, uh, Today, I know of maybe three Jungians in the world who are studying alchemy. It's not easy to get a book published on alchemy anymore, as you can imagine. We're not running into thousands of people desperately eager to read about it. Uh, but there is some good research that's still going on uh, here and there. It does seem like it may be losing a little juice again. So hopefully without a war, We'll have to wait and see what's going to revise it. Some scholars have tried to study the differences between all of these different schools. Uh, you know, what is an uh, image in the, in the Greek alchemy? Does it have the same meaning in Sufi alchemy? Uh, Jung didn't care about that. Jung was ahistorical. He took all the images from alchemy from all over the world, from all times and places, and said they're all the same. They all come from the same place, the psyche, and they're all talking about the same mysteries. That, that approach has been rejected today. Uh, it's the same approach that Karenia used in his study of mythology, and uh, other people at that time would, would use the same method that Jung did, but it's no longer in favor. People would rather know specifically what Greek alchemy was, not how the image in Greek alchemy was the same as the one in Latin alchemy. Myths, 
may be said to be a governing system of symbols that tend to uh, orchestrate our experiences and our perceptions and our ways of understanding things. Uh, science is a myth that we have today, uh, although maybe it's weakening a little bit. Uh, but alchemy was certainly influenced by mythic ideas. And over on the left, I have some of the main mythic imagery uh, that influenced alchemy. These mythic images really are the core, the bones of alchemy. They are what motivated the alchemists and gave them the idea that they were doing something that was incredibly meaningful and spiritual. The two major imagery, uh, the Anthropos uh, and the Sparks of Light. Uh, very significant in the development of alchemy. This is my PowerPoint, by the way. This is as close as I get. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a myth, a, a myth, a Gnostic myth, a Manichaean myth uh, that is, uh, I think, illustrative of the Gnostic myths in general that had a tremendous influence on the development of alchemy. Manichaeism was founded by Mani, which makes sense. Uh, he was a real person. We know he was a real person. We know when he was born. We know when he died. Uh, he died horribly, being tortured to death by the Orthodox of his time, who thought he was a heretic. Uh, the fate of many alchemists and Gnostics. But in the beginning, Mani says, there existed a god of light who ruled over the seers of light and a lesser god, a god of darkness, who ruled over the seers of darkness. And there was no interaction between the two for aeons and aeons and aeons. But at some moment, the dark god realized that the, the power of the light was much greater than the power of the darkness. And being a good representative of the darkness, he became very ambitious and jealous and wanted the light for himself. So he attacked the powers of the light. And this gave the god of light, who was uh, essentially an unknown, unknowable god, gave this god a terrible problem because he was a light god, right? He couldn't fight back. He couldn't hurt anybody. It was against his very nature. So there was no way to defend against the forces of darkness. So he had this great idea that if he couldn't do it, maybe he could create somebody who could. Uh, so the first step towards the creation of the physical universe was the creation of the Anthropos. The Anthropos was as powerful as the unknown god, but just a little bit less. And he wasn't quite as uh, bound by light morality, let's say. He could fight. He could kill the, the forces of darkness. The Anthropos, Anthropos is Greek for man, human being. Uh, and the reason it's called that is because it's a god in the form of a human being. This is uh, Adam Kadmon of Kabbalah, uh, the Anthropos in certain Gnostic traditions is Christ as a cosmic god, as a cosmic being. So all of the power of the god of light appears in the form of a human being. Of course, there weren't human beings yet, so uh, the Anthropos doesn't look like us, we look like him. So he was also not a he, really, he was both, male and female. He incorporated both. So the Anthropos rallies the forces of light and he attacks the dark, but he loses, which is rather shocking in a nice myth about light and dark. And he's held captive, he's imprisoned, okay? So all the angels go to the god of light and say, you know, you got to do something about this. We're going to lose the war if you don't rescue this guy. Uh, so he creates another redeemer figure. Uh, and this redeemer figure, sometimes it's Sophia, the great goddess. Sometimes it's a pre-runner of Christ. Not Jesus, but Christ as a cosmic god who incarnates as Jesus. Uh, and they go back to rescue the Anthropos, and they do. They're able to, to save him from the clutches of darkness and they return him to heaven. <clears throat> but he had five souls 
that were fighting on his side, and they could not be saved. Uh, and what the forces of darkness do is they create the physical universe, and they scatter these forces uh, of light everywhere. So the sparks of light originate from the Anthropos because they're his souls, uh, but they've been lost to the darkness, which is our world. <clears throat> for Mani and for the Gnostics, this world is a concentration camp. We're all imprisoned by the evil forces of the dark. And the only way to escape is to uncover the spark of light that we really are. So every human being has a spark of light within them. But, uh, Mani goes further, everything has a spark of light. This table has a spark of light. The lamp has a spark of light. Everything that exists in the created universe contains within it this hidden spark of light. And so the Manichaeans developed this uh, technique for liberating the sparks of light. Uh, they would meditate as they ate and imagine liberating the sparks of light from the food that they were eating. Although they would never eat animals because if you ate animals, you, you kept that spark of light imprisoned in yourself. But you could free it from a vegetable, like you could free the carrot spark of light and the lettuce spark of light. Uh, and that's their job. The job of the Manichaean mystic was to liberate these sparks of light. They are a, a spiritual force. They are a god, a divine force trapped in matter trapped in the material world. And the forces of the dark that have invaded the forces of the light will never be defeated until we liberate all the sparks of light. Because once we've liberated all the sparks of light, the Anthropos is restored to his totality. Uh, and the, somehow that will equate with the forces of darkness being ostracized and kept in their own concentration camps so they can't bother us anymore. This idea of the sparks of light is all through Gnosticism. It's the basis of Luriana Kabbalah, uh, which is exactly the same idea. Adam Kadmon was the Anthropos. There's a great disaster that occurs when God creates the universe, and all the sparks of light have, are trapped. In uh, Kabbalah, there isn't a force of darkness that does it. It's God that kind of screws up. The Kabbalists were very real about God being able to make mistakes. So God makes this terrible mistake. He throws all of his light into a container, and the container breaks, which is not a happy thing. And so when the container breaks, light is shattered and goes everywhere. It's trapped again in the material world. But in whatever the cause of it is, in the esoteric tradition, this idea that there are aspects of the divinity that is trapped in the material world is universal in almost all of the systems. Different ideas connected to it, but the same basic mythological idea. So, who can liberate the Anthropos? Only human beings themselves. The Anthropos has this... Uh, incredibly powerful God of the universe. He is the, the God of creation. The original God of light has nothing to do with creation. It's all about the Anthropos. Uh, but he can't save himself. So we have to do it. And that introduces that third mythological idea, the idea of redemption. This was huge in alchemy, huge. Uh, so the alchemists take this idea and say, okay, in every material object, there's a spark of light. But we're practical alchemists. We know how to handle both material and spiritual forces. What if we, using our chemical means, liberated a spark of light from its trapped and then did something with it? Now, the Gnostic would say, no, you don't do anything with it. Just give it back to the Anthropos. Go back up to heaven. We don't want anything to do with the material world. It's, it's, it's gross. It's horrible. The body is evil. Uh, you know, all those kinds of ideas. The alchemists rejected all of that. And they said, no, we're going to liberate the spark. We're going to make it go on high so we can uh, purify it again. But then we're going to bring it back down. 
and we're going to bring it back down and we're going to put it back into matter. But it's going to be purified matter, not the same old matter that we're used to. So in alchemy, we take the, the idea of the spark of light and we say at a very practical, experimental level, I can separate the light from the matter and then I can purify both of them and then I recombine them. And when I've recombined them, I've created something extraordinary. Uh, what they call the Philosopher's Stone or the Phileas Philosophorum, which just means the son of the philosophers. The son of the philosophers gives you the idea that this is a living being that they're talking about. For the alchemist, if you could liberate the light and then reconnect it to the material world, you're creating a divine being. And it, it's what they call the divine being of the uh, macrocosm versus the microcosm. The Phileas Philosophorum, according to the alchemists, was Christ's brother. He was an equal to Christ. Christ ruled the upper world, but the, the, the uh, Phileas Philosophorum ruled our world. He rules the world of matter and of creation. Now, if you said that in the 13th century, you can imagine the church's reaction to that. You're telling me that you can create something that's the equivalent of Christ. No, that's not legal. That's heresy. So the alchemists, especially in the Middle Ages, had to cover up what they were talking about. Otherwise, they would have been uh, burnt at the stake, and a number of them were. But behind some of their most curious uh, metaphors and symbols is this idea of the, what I call in my book, the, the baby God, the God that we're trying to give birth to uh, through our own alchem alchemical efforts. Jung went so far as to say all of alchemy is about the creation of the Anthropos. He was very adamant about that. Uh, he first said it about Greek uh, alchemy, and then he moved it to be all of alchemy. Well, how, how we create the Anthropos is through the creation of that uh, Phileas, Phileas Fasorum, uh, by bringing to life something that's brand new, uh, that has never really existed until we create it. Now, they wouldn't say we create it, they would say we give birth to it. They called their uh, pelican, their, their kind of a big retort, the womb. They, they equated it to the womb because they were going to give birth to this God from that place. Now Jung used the Anthropos in a, in a slightly different way, as did the Sufis, uh, to mean the union of the human and the divine. So it's a, just a slight modification of this idea that I have within me this spark of light that's a divinity, and it's me. I'm also at the same time that divinity, uh, but I'm also a human being. So if I can create the Phyllis, uh, uh, let's just call him the sun, uh, getting tired of saying all that Latin, uh, I've also transformed my own soul. And in the process of giving birth to this new divinity, uh, I have united my own divine nature with my own human nature. And that's the Anthropos as well. Then it's not referring to this cosmic God, it's referring to the human God uh, as an individual, as a person. So that's the reason symbolically that the Anthropos appears as a human being because it's a God human being. And if you read Answer to Job in uh, Jung's works, you'll see that he thought uh, that was an invitation for the human side of the psyche and the divine side of the psyche to uh, marry, to come into union with each other. So in that context, the Anthropos also symbolizes the enlightened human being the human being who has individuated to such a point that they're not only human, they're also divinity of some kind. Uh, those are fairly hard concepts to get our head around, uh, but it's one of the most fascinating aspects 
and I'm going to give you some illustrations of this tomorrow. It's one of the most fascinating aspects of the uh, esoteric tradition that they view the human being as a sleeping god. There's none of this sin stuff. We are not sinful creatures. We are divine creatures, but we've forgotten who we were. Uh, because, why? Because the light has been trapped in matter. And so, so long as my spark of light is trapped in matter, I'll just keep reincarnating over and over again. But if I can liberate that spark and then unite with it, then that, that would be the definition of enlightenment that the Anthropos symbolizes. So the alchemists also believed that they were redeemers. They believed that they were redeemers in many different ways. And according to the alchemists, if uh, the, the act of Christ's redemption of the world was insufficient. It wasn't complete. We have to complete it. Uh, and again, it, it views the alchemist as a very powerful spiritual being, on par with the divinity in some ways. One of the ways they express this is that they would use the book of Genesis as an alchemical text. Uh, and so they would work with light, try to create light in the way that God did in order to create in their little world uh, this, this new divine being. But they, uh, the ones that were a little less philosophic and ambitious also believed that uh, alchemists were redeemers because they were transmuting lead into gold. Now, from their perspective, and I, I think this goes back to Aristotle, there was the idea that metals grew in the earth, that lead, if left in the earth for a million years, would naturally become gold. It was their evolution. So lead is a sick gold. It's a deformed gold. It's an undeveloped gold. So the alchemist says, well, I don't want to wait a million years. I can do this in my laboratory in maybe five. Uh, they're not just making gold so they have money. They're trying to redeem lead. They're trying to transmute it into its healthy form. And they had this idea with all of matter that this earth could be a paradise if the impurities could be transmuted out and uh, the lead of our own world could become a golden world. They applied that to the human being as Jung does. We start out lead. We're unconscious, we're chaotic, we're uh, impulsive and destructive and what have you, but we can transmute our psyches into gold. And if we do that, then we experience the anthropos. And then we experience ourselves as more than human, as more than lead. And as was said earlier, if you take the world that we live in at its concrete terms, it's a pretty hopeless situation. But if you take the world that we live in as something that could be transmuted and redeemed, especially through the, through the imagination and through the finding of meaning, uh, then it's not so hopeless. And we, Jung was an incredible optimist. If you think what he lived through in terms of World War I, World War II, the Nazis being his neighbors, uh, he was obsessed with the idea of suffering and what causes it. And that left him fairly gloomy. Uh, but at the same time, he believed totally in the human psyche's ability to transmute and to, to individuate. So much so that you know, uh, he believed that if enough people individuated, there would be no nuclear war. You know, he's talking in the 50s now. Yeah. But if not enough people individuate, then we're all in deep trouble. The other motif, I didn't write it up there, but it goes with this, is re death and rebirth. Uh, alchemy is all about death and rebirth. The first alchemical process is called the negredo or the mortificatio which means the blackness or death, the death process. If you think about it, uh, the reason that it starts with death is that the spark is trapped, right? So in order to liberate the spark, which is equivalent to the soul and the spirit for the alchemist, I have to kill the original substance, remove its soul and spirit, 
put them up here somewhere and purify them. And then I try to bring the, bo the body back to life. I transform the, the material body. And they did this by reducing it to ashes. The alchemists believed that ashes were the finest form of, of matter, the most pure form of matter. So I burn my substance. What happens when you boil stuff? You know, the steam comes up. Well, the steam is the soul and the spirit escaping. Okay. I reduce my matter to ashes. That's the most pure form of matter. I purify the soul and the spirit through alchemical procedures. And then I reintroduce them to the ashes and I create a new matter, a divine matter, a transmuted matter. But it can't happen without the, the death of the previous existence, which is rather lamentable when it comes time to analysis and psychological work, because it means our ego has to die in order to be transformed into its true nature. And that's never a pleasant process. But again, alchemy was incredibly optimistic. The, the human being has the power to redeem the whole universe, to liberate all the divine elements that are trapped, and to become a divine being in and of themselves. When they've transmuted the, the uh, ashes by adding the spirit and the soul back to it, they knew they weren't talking about a physical body anymore. That we have now entered what they would consider and what still would be called the subtle realm, the realm of subtle bodies. Uh, the subtle realm, the subtle body, is a body of immortality. In, in alchemy, especially Chinese alchemy, you create that in your lifetime. So when you die, you just kind of change your location a little bit and you move into your immortal body and you never die. So it had all kinds of implications. Certainly one of the goals of alchemy was immortality. Uh, and again, they didn't mean the immortality of the physical body, but the subtle body. And the only way we can really understand these processes and what the alchemist was talking about was to realize they're not talking about simple physical substances. They're talking about subtle substances. It's no uh, accident that homeopathy derived from alchemy. If, you know, homeopathy thinks that it has taken the spiritual essence, the healing essence of matter. Uh, you don't even have to take the substance. You just have to, to drink the water or whatever it is that they've, they've given you. A very alchemical idea. Uh, and uh, as the what I'm, what I'm going to be trying to do tomorrow is to develop some of these ideas a little more, especially imagination. Um, the, uh, the writings on the imaginal world that derive from alchemy are amazing. Uh, they are the source of uh, incredible healing processes that go back to Paracelsus and other alchemists. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do with that is not only try to give you some of those ideas, but also do some active imagination work with them. So I'm going to be talking about active imagination as Jung's technique for the transmutation of the soul. It is probably his most important idea. So as alchemist, I'm working to redeem the world. I'm working to redeem God who's, you know, scattered everywhere. I'm also working to redeem my own soul, which has been led, and now I want it to be gold. Uh, so redemption is uh, part of the alchemical process at every step of the way. And again, it, it's one of those places where alchemy very much stepped away from Christianity by saying redemption is not complete, uh, and if the human being doesn't do it, nobody will. So all the way from the God trapped in matter, the little baby God that we want to give birth to, to healing medicines, uh, and as well my own individuation and enlightenment, all derive from uh, the alchemist as redeemer. They also say, uh, naturally enough, there wouldn't be any alchemy if there wasn't an alchemist. 
Uh, Jung says the same thing. He says, if there wasn't an ego, God couldn't manifest. So both the esoteric tradition and Jungian psychology don't degrade the ego at all. They don't, they don't hold it in contempt. They want to transform it because it's usually lead and they want it to become gold, but they never want to destroy it as other spiritual traditions do. So in some ways, this creation of the Anthropos can be seen as the creation of a divine consciousness of some kind, a cosmic consciousness, uh, which goes from one extreme at the human level to the other extreme at the Anthropos level, and is a unity. It's a uni unified consciousness that includes both human and divine. And you can imagine being able to swing back and forth in your states of consciousness between those two levels. It's because of this mythic level of alchemy that I think alchemy survived for so long. If it was simply about chemistry, uh, there's no reason to imagine that it would spread throughout the world in the way that it did, following uh, these series of wars. And it, for me, it's a, another example of uh, Heraclitus said, war is the mother of all invention. He didn't mean it in such a grand way. Uh, but in this case, we can see that one of the benefits of the wars that were fought, with all their horrific nature, was this alchemical myth that kept being re rejuvenated and renewed and deepened and transformed. Most important, unlike other spiritual traditions, alchemy was very hands-on, concrete. Uh, this isn't just speculation. I can actually do this in my laboratory. Uh, you know, that's not so easy, obviously. And when spiritual alchemy and practical alchemy split, the laboratory became the, the human being. Uh, but even today, there are practicing alchemists who are trying to recreate in their laboratories these kinds of experiences. And it gave to the alchemist uh, an ability to be practical about these things. It wasn't just you know, idle speculation and very nice mythic concepts. They could work with it. They really believed that they could work with spirit as a substance. They could touch it. They could feel it because it was in the subtle body. Uh, you know, I mean in the subtle realm. One definition the alchemists give of the subtle realm is it's the place where spirit becomes matter and matter becomes spirit. So it's the place where they overlap. And because they overlap, when I'm messing around with my matter, I'm, I'm trying to transmute lead, I'm also messing around with my own soul. And I'm messing around with the Anthropos. All those things happened at the same time. That's the other alchemical statement that's pretty famous, as above, so below. Whatever happens to me happens to my lead in the, in the retort. Whatever happens to the lead in the retort is happening in my own soul. There was no difference. If I create uh, gold from lead, I am enlightened. It was proof of my enlightenment because at the same time, I would become gold. Couldn't do one without the other. Now we know it's not so easy to make gold out of lead. It can be done, incidentally. Uh, it has been done using a cyclotron. Uh, bombard the little atoms in such a way that they, they change their nature from lead into gold. It's pretty interesting. Problem is it's so expensive that you know, there's no point in doing it. But it does show that it can be done, even though the alchemists were a little fuzzy about some of the details. Uh, let's see, how are we doing? Okay. So alchemy promised its students, if you follow this text, if you just do what this text tells you to do, you will uh, experience altered states of consciousness and magical uh, transmutations in the material world, healing, things of that sort. But as I said, they never told you how to do that. They would lie about it. They would try to trick you uh, because if you were not a a master in your own right, then you shouldn't be doing alchemy. It was kind of mean and very frustrating if you're studying it. 
because they will, they will make a very definitive statement, x, x equals y, and then in the next paragraph they'll say, but maybe not. Maybe x doesn't equal y. And then they don't tell you what x is. Uh, what they call the prima materia is the great mystery of alchemy. What do you start with? How do you start? Well, you can use lead, but they would say, no, you can't use real lead. That's silly. You have to use subtle lead. You have to use lead that belongs to the subtle realm. Well, how do you find that? They won't tell you. But if you work hard enough, if you pray hard enough, if you develop your consciousness long enough, the answer will come to you. And then you won't tell anybody either. Uh, you'll get your revenge. Alchemy consisted of a whole lot of processes and different kinds of chemical operations. Uh, I mentioned in the Grado, there's a solutio, which means uh, water, using water or mercury to dissolve things. Calcinaccio, which is to burn things, uh, and so on. I'm not going to talk about those uh, tonight or tomorrow, actually. But if you're interested, there, the best uh, development of them is in volume 12 of the Collected Works, uh, Psychology and Alchemy by Jung as well as Ed Edward Edinger has a great book called The Anatomy of the Psyche, which takes these uh, same alchemical processes and show you how you would experience those in analysis and in your dreams, in your dream life. It's amazing how many of you will dream alchemical imagery without even knowing it. Uh, some of these workshops, what I've done is ask people to just give me a dream, any dream that they could think of, and we'll find alchemical imagery there. Uh, it is, it's really pervasive. It's that deep within the, the human psyche, the system. And again, I think that's why it survives so long. So I think I'm going to stop here. Tomorrow, uh, the idea again behind all of this is the idea of imagination. The, the notion that what we understand as imagination has nothing to do with what the alchemists thought of imagination. Uh, and they developed very, very interesting imagery and symbolism and uh, even philosophy to express their experience of the imagination. And what makes Jungian thought so much part of the esoteric tradition is not only its view of the human psyche, but its respect for the imagination. Jung said every analysis should end in teaching the uh, client how to do active imagination. If the client hasn't learned how to do active imagination, he said the analysis is a failure. Well, nobody does that anymore. Nobody believes that anymore. It's one of the mysteries of the evolution of Jungian thought that it doesn't uh, honor active imagination very much at all anymore. But we will. I'm going to try to give you, if you've never done active imagination, I can give you some very simple ways to get started with it. And we're going to use some of the alchemical images uh, to play around with imaginally, in addition to talking about it in a, in a more um, theoretical way. So why don't we do our little 10 minute break and then we should have some time for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's an aspect that I didn't mention, but astrology is very important to alchemy. Um, the symbolism is shared in the sense that you're talking about. Lead would be Saturn. Uh, silver is the moon. Gold is the sun. Tin is Jupiter, and so on. So the astrological influences of those planets would be consulted by the alchemists when they were going to do a process. They would want to wait for the right astrological moment. So uh, if they were working with tin, they would watch Jupiter's movement through the sky and whatever the astrologers were going to say about that. Uh, how much cross influence there was, we don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. Uh, but definitely astrology was always consulted by the alchemists.
from the earliest times, because astrology is about <clears throat> at least as old as alchemy and, and very likely much older. It goes back to the Babylonians at least. So it's just an area that I haven't studied very much, so I haven't talked very much about it, but it was important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't uh, follow in here. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't follow exactly uh, in the beginning the the, uh, the fall, if you will, from uh, the original source. Um, there was something above Anthropos, which gave birth to Anthropos. And then where did the darkness come from? Good question. It, no, it didn't. Appear. It's always been. There's always been light and dark. They were none, neither was created, neither had a beginning. Uh, they, that's why darkness can't be destroyed. It can only be isolated, because it, it's somehow eternal in its own nature. But for a very long time, if you can think about it in terms of time, they had no interaction with each other. And it, The Anthropos is, yeah, the first created being, uh, totally identical with God, only a little smaller. Okay, as was the darkness. And no, he has no relationship to the darkness, not in the Manichaean system. Manichaeism is very dualistic. For, you, for Jung, the Anthropos would have to include darkness, right? Uh, very much his idea of the shadow and that the self has to include the darkness as well as the light. But that's not, that wasn't in the Manichaean system at all. So it was as uh, equivalent to the uh, Eastern spiritual traditions where the, the, du the duality. Yes, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, that light became trapped in that earth. And, uh, and right. That's the, yeah, that's kind of the evolution, evolutionary history of how creation came to be. But it was always a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I do at times too. Oh, he's got the mic, so we'll do you next. <laughs> I'm wondering um, how the similarities in alchemy and, and Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. in regard to the sparks of light. With alchemy, the outcome, desired outcome, is the Philosopher's Stone. I just wonder what's, how does Kabbalah relate to that? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, they're not identical systems. The, the idea of uh, creating a new god would not be in Kabbalah, not in the same way that it's in alchemy. Kabbalah is too rooted in Orthodox Judaism to have this idea of uh, an inferior god or a god, uh, how do you say it? I mean, God is perfect, only he's screwed up. It's kind of a paradox for the Kabbalist. But they have very much the image of the Anthropos. If you look at some of the texts there, uh, world tree is in the form of a human being. Um, but for them, that would be Adam Kadmon. And uh, the way that they put it is that every human being is part of the soul of Adam Kadmon. Um, but we are not Adam Kadmon. Whereas uh, for the alchemists, we would become the anthropos in many ways. Uh, so Yeah, the, at least the way they would perceive it. Yeah. I mean, in, in Kabbalah, the idea is to know God and to, uh, through a, a variety of techniques, uh, receive revelation, personal revelations from God. Uh, but it's certainly not about creating a new God or a baby God. or uh, At least I've never come across an equivalent to the Philosopher's Stone in, in Kabbalah. But they definitely influenced each other. And there are Kabbalists who write about alchemy. And a lot of Christian alchemists write about Kabbalah. Especially in the 17th century, there's uh, formed what was called Christian Kabbalah. 
and that had a big influence on the spiritual alchemists. But they are cross-fertilizing with different systems. Yeah, did you have a question? Hi. Um, Hi. I just was wondering, um, it seems to me that there's a, well, I mean, you mentioned that alchemy is maybe dead a little bit now. And it seems to me that there is a, a revival, and I'm, I'm not sure whether it's, I mean, I think that there's a, a multifarious revival, some of which may be regressive in some ways, and mm -hmm. some of which some of which may be new, uh, new things that are going on. But I see, I see many revivals around me, um, just um, of alchemy. Yeah, oh. in various forms, hmm. uh, in meditation, and people that are trying to get in touch with um, native traditions, mm -hmm. and, um, people that are trying to develop that in new ways. Some more, uh, some less psychologically. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether, whether you were interested at all in that. Or oh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, they're still practicing alchemists. I've met several of them. Uh, quite fascinating. One guy created a real, uh, they tested it, and it was it performed an incredible healing. But like alchemy always, he could never re replicate it. That's the problem with imagination. You can't replicate things in the same way. <clears throat> but what I mean is that there are not so many people who would say, I'm an alchemist, and this is the process that I follow. There, there is that bringing together of many different traditions, which I think is very healthy in a lot of ways. But uh, alchemy informed my myth, my own personal myth, to such a degree that I would consider myself in line with the alchemists. But you don't see that very much anymore. Uh, and it may come in that form. It may come as a, an amalgamation of, of different traditions. But yeah, I find that very interesting. Yeah. I see some similarities between the Anthropos and the Purusha myth. And the what? The Purusha myth from the Vedas. Um, oh, Purusha, yeah. And I, I sometimes try and wonder, is this what Young said, is just a spontaneously emerging site from our psyches to express something? Or is, is it passed down? Like, because I think Mani was influenced by Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's both. Uh, if we didn't have the same kind of psychic structure, we wouldn't find them interesting, right? It wouldn't get passed down because I couldn't relate to it. But because it resonates with something in me that's the same as in you, uh, then I'm interested in it. So Jung would agree with that too. He wouldn't say everything is born just spontaneously out of the psyche. Uh, what, what we're dealing with are cultural images that have evolved over centuries and millennium. Uh, so definitely cross-fertilization. That's why even in these traditions, uh, it's very clear that Gnosticism had a huge impact on alchemy. Uh, so uh, why? There were definitely teachers who did both. Uh, but also, I think, because we have that innate yearning for the same kind of experiences and the same imagery speaks to us. Exactly. Right. Yep. Do you see a link between the Purusha and the Anthropos? Oh yeah, I, Purusha is considered an Anthropos image, for sure. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, so there's, there's a tradition that Mani studied in India for a long time. Whether it's true or not, we don't know, but there was that tradition. So that would symbolize certainly that he was influenced by India in some way. And, yeah. How did you get that name, Purusha. Purusha. Purusha? Uh, P-U-R-U-S-H-A? Yeah. It's a very much an Anthropos kind of image in the in the Hindu world. Wasn't he the original creator or something? Uh, yeah. yeah. And he splits into two. And that yeah. 
Right, his bones and his skin, and yeah. Right, right. Uh, uh, hi. I just, oh. um, I just got this book, The Practice of Ally Work, and I was kind of looking at it. I haven't read it, so, um, but just looking at it on the, the different sides of the cover, what it really reminds me of with the picture of the crow and the discussion of ally work, meeting and partnering with your spirit guide in the imaginal world, is um, shamanism. Yeah. And I was wondering if, um, again, that's something that sort of seems historically to possibly either predate or come separately more directly from um, uh, indigenous cultures mm -hmm. of various kinds and how you would relate that to what you were saying about alchemy. Yeah, all these, all these different traditions are definitely part of the soup. Uh, shamanism, I think most scholars would agree that shamanism is the original religion. Uh, it goes back to the uh, indigenous tribal systems and, uh, from thousands of years of evolution. Uh, but I think the way that it would cross over with alchemy the most is through the imagination because uh, the shamanic journey is definitely what I would consider an imaginal experience. Uh, and that would relate to, to alchemy in that sense. Whether it had a direct correlation, that's hard to say. Uh, Eliade, uh, who wrote a nice little book on alchemy, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, believed that uh, originally some of the alchemical imagery went back to smiths. The first smiths were considered shamans because they had power over metals uh, and power over fire. Uh, so there might very well be some indigenous roots to alchemy that we haven't totally uncovered yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't need the microphone. Thank you. So I was actually wondering uh, listening to you talk, the, the nature of existence is alchemic in and of itself, hmm. I think, in a lot of ways. And um, is individuation the recognition of the light within oneself? And how would that fall in line with Anthropos? From the union perspective, I'm curious if you don't mind what I'm asking. Uh. For sure, alchemists believe that the whole universe was an alchemical process. Um, that there was a constant, uh, what they call the, the golden chain of being. Everything is connected from God down to you know, the lowest molecule. So everything that happens is part of that alchemical process. I think that's, yeah, they would definitely agree with that. In terms of the Anthropos and uh, the, the classic Jungian perspective, yeah, I also had a question, too, about it. individuation is a recognition of the fact that of the light within yourself, right? And that being the fundamental principle to your existence and your being, mm -hmm. and not falling in line with your being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jung, Jung, for Jung, very clearly, Anthropos is a self. Mm -hmm. They're totally along the lines. Every interpretation he makes of it, it's, it's the self. And, and for Jung, the self is the whole personality. Uh, it's also the divine spark within us. So in that sense, it relates to the alchemical image. But Jung, you know, was not such a fan of the light. He believed that the light and the dark had to come together. Um, so he would not, I think, agree with the idea that if we can uh, find that light within us, that would be individuation. He would say that that spark within us is also dark. Mm -hmm. And that to individuate, we have to find a way to, to be comfortable with that as well. Well, therein lies the alchemy. Huh? I said, therein lies the alchemy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm intrigued about what you said that active imagination is not in favor of life. Mm. Um, and as a lay person, Active imagination has been such a transformative experience in my own analysis and in my ongoing life. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to hear you say that. Could you say more about why that might be? Yeah, that's the question. Um, 
Back in 1977, a French analyst wrote a paper on uh, the uh, Jungian analyst's resistance to active imagination. And what seemed to happen, and this happens in every tradition, uh, you have the, the teacher and you have the disciples, first generation, and you get this second generation who decide they don't agree with everything the first generation said. Yeah. And what tended to happen was, that, as you know, because you've done active imagination, it's not so easy. It's an extremely challenging process. And you have to be willing to let go a lot of the ego's positions. Uh, and I think gradually what happened was people were trained who were not willing to do that. Um, and because they weren't willing to do that, they didn't have the experience of it. And because they didn't have the experience of it, their students didn't have the experience of it. And then they developed a theory to justify that. Uh, so I think it's incredibly sad because you have today uh, many different schools of Jungian analysis, at least three or four. And some of them don't deal with dreams. Some of them don't deal with the unconscious whatsoever. Um, they're very neo-Freudian, basically. Now, again, I think that, that tends to happen because not everybody can have these experiences. But a lot of people want to be analysts anyway, which is fine. Uh, but then they lose that intimate connection with it. And it becomes just an idea that Jung had that was probably not so great. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. I always think of uh, St. Francis, you know, who, a rather radical person, uh, and he started the Franciscan order to carry out his ideas, and before he was dead, they threw him out of the order uh, because the next generation said he's too radical, we can't live like that anymore. Uh, so it happens in groups a lot. It's very interesting. It's, I think it's sad, but... Uh, and there, there, there could be a comeback. There are a number of uh, trainees that I know who are uh, really interested in active imagination. So uh, it's possible it'll it'll move back in the other in the other way. But we have to expect those kinds of things. I think. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about um, a pretty pr uh, practical way of approaching this idea of alchemy. And I wonder what you would have to say about creativity. Mm -hmm. And I heard from other artists, I like to write poetry. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a moment in creating the poem, when it works, it comes together. And there is a, an incredible sense of Mm -hmm. My wife is a poet. She's written several books. She's also a cook and a gardener and puts me to shame in every possible way. And she talks about the ecstasy of writing a poem. When the poem comes together, she would describe it as an ecstatic experience. And that, that then connects us with all of this stuff. There's no question that creativity can be a union of the unconscious and the conscious mind. And that's a state of wholeness. And it just feels like a gift when it comes. Yeah. And that's because the, the, the unconscious aspect of the psyche is stepping in to meet you. Uh, and when that happens, it is magic. I think that's very much what alchemy was about. Uh, and many alchemists were poets, too. It's kind of interesting. Anybody else? Over here. Within um, this ontology of understanding that the spark is <coughs> is there any room within the alchemical tradition that the trapped nature of it is not so much that it's trapped, or is there a discovery of that spark that it doesn't necessarily? Uh, yeah, it's. it's That, that somehow being trapped is part of the process of right. being liberated. Um, I think they would agree with that, but they, they wouldn't say you can't stay there. 
too long, because if you do, you'll just be trapped anyway. Uh, so you have to take your experience of being trapped and make magic with that. Uh, use, uh, use the alchemy of your own experience to find a way to liberate that spark. Mm -hmm. But certain, they would certainly... Is, is there a necessary... Um, in order to be liberated, you, you must be trapped? Or is there uh, a space where there is no trap and therefore liberation? Is, uh, I see. Not, uh, I don't think they would say... I don't think they would specifically say that, but the implication of the myth is that if we hadn't been trapped, we, we couldn't possibly be liberated. Uh, I think they would definitely agree with that. If you weren't lead, you couldn't become gold. I see. So, uh, but they, they would also say, yeah, but don't get too attached to the lead stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what would, in your view, what would be the goal of, of um, alchemists over, the, uh, over these uh, many years? Is there a common, because there's the aspect of uh, trying to control or change the world, mm -hmm. and then there's the inner aspect. So, uh, and also, has, has that changed over the centuries? Is there, is there a new goal? Has it evolved? I don't, I don't know if I would say there's a new goal. There might be a new understanding of the goal. Uh, what, what Jung points out, I think correctly, is that the alchemist had no knowledge about psychology. So everything was about the matter, uh, its effect on me, but I didn't work on my complexes to get rid of my lead, for example. I wasn't part of the, part of the process. So we've added uh, the whole aspect of the psychological aspect of individuation. Individuation starts uh, with the, the lead of your complexes and has to transform those uh, and with the shadow, what Jung would call the shadow, and has to integrate that. The alchemists wouldn't talk that way. Would they agree with the ultimate goal? I think so. I think they would. Is there a, a goal beyond the Anthropos? I don't think any tradition would say that. Because that, that's the ultimate of creation. We can't go past the, the Anthropos. Even in, the, in many of the Gnostic systems, you couldn't get back to the original God. You could only get back to the Anthropos. Uh, so that was considered the ultimate enlightenment experience. And so, because so few of us can ever experience that, it's hard to imagine something beyond that. If you were there, you might have a whole different vista uh, of what the next goal might be. But as a culture, we haven't gotten there, for sure. But I, I would say that doesn't mean it's not there, just we don't know it yet. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Corbin, I just heard the, 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 his name uh, a couple weeks ago. Cor Henry Corbin, yeah. Oh yeah. Could you just say a little bit more about that? And then the, the in Islam, well, certain images are not to be reproduced, right? So right. Is there, is there any uh, conflict there? Not for the Sufis, but. Uh, for the Sufis who lived in this tradition, they were always on the fringe of the Orthodox. So for the Orthodox, there would be a real conflict there, but not for the, not for the mystics. Um, okay, so he, was, he, was, he was a Sufi, right? Yeah. Okay. Henry Corbin was a French uh, scholar who fell in love with Persia or Iran, uh, and he fell in love with the Sufi tradition. And it's thought that he, he, he was a practicing Sufi. Uh, so a lot of his ideas are from the Sufis, but they've been definitely uh, developed by him in pretty unique ways. How, how unique? Uh, just the whole power of the imagination and what he calls the imaginal world. That uh, every experience along the way uh, towards the Anthropos, you would meet angels and demons and uh, personifications of all kinds of, of forces. Someone was mentioning the consciousness that everything has. Uh, for the Sufis, everything has their own angel. The earth has its own angel. I have my own angel, which is what I call the ally. Um, 
And that angel, if I could unite with that angel in the deepest possible way, we would be the Anthropos. That's, that's pretty much his, his uh, shtick. And he, and he does it brilliantly. I really recommend those books. There's a, another writer named Tom Cheatham um, who has written four books about Corbin's work. And uh, those are very well worth reading about the imagination. Tom, uh, Thomas Cheatham, C-H-E-E-T-H-A-M. Uh, when the Wakes who wrote the powers that be, he's a Christian theologian. Uh, I think he's dead now, but uh, he writes about it, angels every mm. every group has this angel. Right. right. Steiner does too, right? Steiner has a lot of angel stuff. Uh, if you think about Jung, you know, and active imagination, for those of you who have done it, uh, you're always dealing with a person of some kind, in, an internal uh, inner figure. So it's very much, uh, the Sufis wouldn't call them inner figures, they might call them angels. Uh, but it's the same imaginal experience. Uh, if you read Jung's Red Book, right, he's, he's always dealing with these figures. Uh, Philemon and Salome. And, uh, so from the Jungian perspective, especially at the time of Jung, the psyche is, consists of all these different characters that we can relate to. And that's the core of active imagination. <clears throat> they could be angels, they certainly would be in other traditions. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering, I'm just so remarkable that Isaac Newton uh, was an alchemist. Yeah. <clears throat> he also ran the mint. Right. And I just wonder if you know about his alchemical working how the science he developed grew out of that and what it meant in relation to the hey. stone or whatever. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't dare to, to try to answer that one. I'm not an expert on him. There's a, uh, again, because his student destroyed all the papers, or most of the papers, we don't know exactly uh, the extent of his alchemical theories. But he was, you know, he was a madman, right? I mean, he did physics or Newtonian physics, right? But he also did alchemy, and he was a theologian, but a crazy theologian. I mean, he was way out there. He was definitely a heretic. Uh, and somehow in his mind, they all definitely fed each other. For him, the, the chemistry and the physics would be very related to the alchemical studies. I think one of the things that he was trying to do was discover the, the, like he discovered the gravity, he was looking for the prima materia, the central dominating principle of the universe. And I think that was part of what his alchemy was about. Uh, Betty Jo Meader, I think, M-E-A-D-E-R, wrote the first book about uh, Newton and his alchemy because it was a forbidden topic. Nobody would talk about it before. Uh, and she developed some of those ideas. Uh, hmm? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in an alchemical way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you think it's conceivable at all that your appropriate subtitle to your lecture might be Spider Man Meets Buddha? Spider Man Meets Buddha? Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't thought about that much. It sounds like a great dream, though. <laughs> in terms of. Um, Spider-Man is very ambivalently held figure to some people. Mm -hmm. He's an Asian of light, some he's an Asian of dark. Yeah. I think the whole fascination we have with superheroes. Well, he's been transformed from a superhuman yeah. into a superhuman. Exactly. And, then, and it, 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 it's not a superhuman. And it elevates our concept of the human again, right? If, if human beings can have these superpowers, uh, then maybe we're not these dimwits that we're made out to be. But it's, it's such an unconscious thing, you know, it's not very well, it's certainly not a spiritual system, right? The spirit system of Spider-Man. Buddhism, as yeah. opposed to the Western Buddhist tradition, the Eastern one is that we all carry around perfection within us rather than it's given to us by grace by some being who is uh, not demeaned the way we are. Mm -hmm. So, possible. Yeah, yeah. 
I was always wondering why we love superheroes so much, but I think that's part of it. They, they carry some kind of numinous fascination uh, that we don't find very anywhere else, really, in the culture. That's about all the time we have. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. And, uh, thank you. Um, if anyone wants to sleep on it, uh, you can just show up tomorrow. It's uh, $60 for members to come to the lecture tomorrow and 75 for non-members, so uh, please come. Thank you.